I want to thank Deborah Gray White for inviting me uh, to participate. Um, I want to thank Darlene again for introduction. I actually want to thank Kathy because the book that Darlene's talking about, The Politics of Public Housing, Black Women's Struggles Against Urban Inequality, I think if Kathy had been missing from the link of women who actually helped me move through and uh, move through towards publication of that book, then I don't know if you would be seeing that book. Um, Kathy was my special editor, and Kathy is the one who tapped me and said, I think we have a publisher for you, and, I, and I'm really interested in your work. At a time when I wasn't sure how many people were interested in low-income black women living in public housing <laughs> or welfare, um, anyone who wasn't seen as uh, respectable or reputable. Um, so my talk today is entitled, um, and I'm going to try real hard to stay on time, my talk today is entitled um, Obscured Lives, Hidden Histories. And I want to start with a quote or a rendition from the Washington Post, December 7, 2006, an article written by Julia Cass and Peter Wariski, uh, Dateline New Orleans, quote, public housing officials decided Thursday to proceed with the demolition of more than 4,500 government apartments here, brushing aside an outcry from residents displaced by Hurricane Katrina who said the move was intended to reduce the ability of poor black people to repopulate the city. Residents and their advocates made emotional, legal, and what they called common sense arguments against demolition at the Housing Authority meeting. Quote, the day you decide destroy our, to destroy our homes, you will break a lot of hearts, said Sharon Pierce Jackson, who lived in one of the now closed projects slated to be raised. She said, quote, we are people. We are not animals, end quote. So the concerns of low-income black women for home and human dignity uttered in this 2006 article and in this 2007 protest image that you see on the screen are too often dismissed, hidden, obscured, too often women like Sharon Pierce Jackson are cast as animals, alligators and wolves, or castigated for their outspokenness, and consistently repositioned decades in and decades out as unworthy seekers of handouts. Rarely are low-income black women's demands situated historically, or recognized historically, or in contemporary times, as reasonable and viable critiques of U.S. democracy. Rarely are low-income black women's demands understood as critical components of post-World War II black liberation struggles, as telling oppositional expressions, exposing the oppressive or ineffective apparatus of the welfare state and black women's collective efforts to change social institutions. By putting the obscure lives and hidden struggles of, in particular, disreputably positioned black women at the center of the analysis, some recent historical studies have made critical interventions. One, by exploring race, gender, and state power on the urban political terrain, and two, by complicating a scholarly black freedom narrative that overall still ignores the historical experiences and political parlance of some of the most marginalized and publicly demonized public citizens in the United States. In my own research and scholarship, I do this in primarily three different ways. By looking at one, the struggles of low-income, subsidy-reliant black women in cities in, post uh, in the post-1940s era. Two, by looking at low-income black women as quote-unquote unlikely actors in the black power movement, and three, by looking uh, at illicit narcotics economies, which includes an examination of black women in disreputable professions. That's my new word. But for the sake of time today, I'll actually focus on urban struggles of low-income subsidy-reliant black women, and during the Q&A, if people are actually interested, I can provide you some examples of the other two ways in which they help us to challenge the historical narratives, our notion of contemporary politics, and the kinds of ways we should be imagining social justice struggles and social movements, both as intellectuals, as academics, and as people who live in the world. Number one, 
so urban struggles of low-income black women who are subsidy reliant. Despite the proliferation of scholarly studies that examine African American women's resistance and movement experiences, only recently have scholars begun to seriously consider, include, and critically engage the stories of low-income black women, not only on their own terms, but for, but for what their citizenship struggles reveal about post-World War II urban residency, black freedom struggles in cities, and the contours of the state and U.S. democracy. Such scholarly examinations of the daily struggles, politicalization, informal networks, associations, and the responses of low-income black women enrich historical understanding of the black urban experience, as well as seriously engage little discussed people and issues in post-World War II cities. So low-income black women's experiences which reveal the human toll of urban living and connect race, gender, class, residence, place, and politics complicate the dominant depiction of post-war cities as veritable urban wastelands. By paying particular attention to the material conditions, the seemingly mundane worries of life, and urban policies that often provided the exigencies for local and national struggles in post-war America, scholars of low-income black women reconsider, even reimagine, the prevailing narratives of black freedom struggles, which have tended to focus on traditional organizations and the more familiar activists linked to them. My goal here is to trouble the waters a little bit, um, to talk about those folks that black women scholars talk about and say that that's positive, but there's a whole lot of black women folks that black women scholars and other black women don't talk about. And I think that really skews the kind of history and the way that we imagine the world and the way that we see themselves connected to those women and those political projects. I think it also prevents us from understanding the long historical roots of a picture which is seen as exceptional or uh, rendered ununderstandable based on what is imagined as something that just happened to occur in a Hurricane Katrina moment. Finally, such scholars welcomely historicize what political scientist Ange Marie Hancock has described in her 2004 study as the contemporary quote unquote politics of disgust which has legitimized the maltreatment and dismissal, not only by government officials, but by many in the academy of poor black single mothers and the gutting of social welfare policies, such as public housing in particular, and the aid to families with dependent children in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. In the wake of public debates over government responsibility driven by the politics of race, gender, residence, and poverty, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, these kinds of demythologizing studies are more necessary now than ever. So I want to give you one historical example, so I can stay on time. I have lots of examples, but I'm going to give you one historical example. Because for me, what is important is to give you the voices, which is why I started with the 2006 article and gave you the voice of, of, of Sharon, which is why I gave you the image so you can see the face and you can see the place. And I all want to give you a historical example of some of the women who were struggling who really provide a kind of context and understanding and a background for making sense of the kinds of things that we imagine emerge or that we hide in the closet or that we don't deal with um, or that we look at and turn our heads away from. So one historical example I'll share with you emerges out of the specific spatial context of public housing in Durham, North Carolina. And apropos, given the drama of disappearing public housing that has been exacerbated in uh, New Orleans in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. As in Durham, similar historical stories abound in cities, including Baltimore, Philadelphia, Chicago, Nashville, St. Louis, and Los Angeles, and a whole lot of others, thereby providing a pathway for exposing the hegemonic boundaries as well as the political limitations of traditional civil rights struggles, and for exploring the often decisive power of urban issues in increasingly black occupied cities to shape citizens' demands for democratic inclusion. McDougal Terrace. McDougal Terrace, a racially segregated public housing complex in Durham, North Carolina, opened in 1953. And its 360 apartments served as home to many black low wage and low income families. On November 11, 1964, Joyce Thorpe, a black divorce, divorced mother of three, 
moved into McDougal Terrace, not even suspecting that she would file a lawsuit against the Housing Authority. She helped to spur a city-based organizing effort and foment the development of a federal regulation to legally protect public housing tenants against retaliatory evictions. But just as important, the battle by Thorpe and her attorney against the Housing Authority officials who they thought persecuted public housing tenants for their activism forced government officials to reckon with the disparate treatment of low-income black women as citizens because they relied on public subsidies. A married mom, homeowner, beauty school graduate, and college student, Thorpe experienced a significant decline in economic security when she divorced. Many women in cities across the nation found themselves in similar harrowing situations that thrust them into not only poverty, but also social positions of disrepute and disgust, particularly because they proactively turned to social welfare programs to abate their and their family's suffering. Having few economically feasible housing options in cities bereft of enough adequate sanitary and affordable residences, Thorpe applied for public housing and moved into McDougal. On August 10th, 1965, tenants elected Thorpe president of the Complex's Mother's Club. She encouraged them to organize and as their leader, asked Durham Housing Authority officials for a meeting space so tenants could plan a child care center. Yeah, seems reasonable. Across the country, Female public housing tenants had formed such groups to promote sociability, share information, pool resources, and develop mechanisms to address the harsh circumstances, ineffective resources, and government irresponsiveness that accompanied being poor in urban America. One day after her election, Thorpe, to the Mother's Club, Thorpe received an eviction notice. When she asked housing authority officials for the reason, she had lived in her apartment eight months without any incident. They gave her none. Fearing that she and her three children would have nowhere to live, Thorpe refused to leave. When the Durham County Sheriff came to put her out, Thorpe locked herself in her apartment and threatened him with deadly bodily harm. More specifically, Thorpe threatened to blow his brains out. Low-income black women's political battles as citizens did not stem simply from the legal prescriptions of civil rights, which often frame historical narratives of black freedom struggles, whether we are discussing national organizations or local battles. Nor did the passage of civil rights legislation mitigate the ordinary and frequent problems related to housing, income, health, and childcare, or necessarily protect them from the whims of government power brokers who, as in the Thorpe case, were their landlords. Facing her family's unexplained expulsion from government housing and potential homelessness, Thorpe filed a lawsuit, quote, claiming that her eviction was based upon her organizational activities with the tenants organization and was a violation of her First Amendment rights, end quote. Protesting what she deemed a spurious and penalizing anti-democratic action by housing officials, Thorpe's physical protest and legal battle is just one example among many that reveal what Tim Kaplan has identified as, quote, an invisible revolution in which women globally have asserted, quote, their collective rights and made broad claims about human needs and linked those social needs to democracy, end quote. Often, these invisible revolutions in post-World War II United States were responses to economic challenges, to spatial realities such as overcrowding, declining urban infrastructures and crime, and to government urban policies, including housing and urban renewal programs and public housing regulations. Confronting then the exclusions wrought by federal urban policies and local government programs and agencies, poor black women vigorously proclaimed that their poverty, 
their positioning, their status as disreputable based on that poverty and the stereotypes in that, that shaped that policy and their position, that, that, that poverty and their position um, as impoverished urban residents on subsidies and their ability and their struggles to contest it, they proclaimed that their poverty did not trump their rights as citizens and as human beings deserving of help, equality, and dignity. Narratives such as these, narratives such as these of low-income black women's lives and resistance help expose the concrete limitations and the multiple manifestations of black freedom struggles in post-World War II urban communities. Such narratives also help expose how low-income black women and poor people generally have been marginalized not only in the historical moment, but also by those writing the historical narratives. In fact, low-income black women's incomplete and freighted historical depiction, if not their utter absence from prior scholarship on black urban America and black freedom struggles, exposes the secondary marginalization, a term I uh, am using from Kathy Cohen's book, The Boundaries of Blackness, exposes the secondary marginalization that they suffered and still experience within black America and among black women, within black history and among black women's historians as a, as a result of their stigmatized positions. In other words, I want to trouble the waters Right? Uh, these narratives don't often appear in recitations of black women's struggles. They don't often appear in recitations of black women's political experience. They don't often appear in recitations of what it's like to live in urban America. Whether it's written by majority, by minority, by black women scholars. Except for those who are beginning to pay attention and who are doing the work themselves. But there's oftentimes I've actually picked up a book recently, or an article and on post-war to America, and looked for how we're reimagining, you know, this is the whole idea of reimagining the long civil rights movement, reimagining the black power struggles, and reimagining struggles for urban democracy. And I rarely find these women in those recitations, even with the research now having been done increasingly since 2002, 2004, 2005, and up till now. So I'm in trouble trouble the waters. Um, let me conclude, I think I'm doing pretty good, let me conclude by offering three it will requires for thought. Three it will requires for counteracting this stigmatization, for unmasking obscured lives, for exposing hidden histories, for expanding historiographies, for rethinking what it means to be a human being, a political actor, in a moment where social justice efforts are more needed now than ever. I guess, you know, you can say that any day, any time, but really for me, this is the moment where this is coming to fruition, and particularly with the financial economic crisis. Three, it will requires. One, it will require the continued analysis of the complex relationships that have rendered and continue to render low-income black women both politically usable and simultaneously absent, fairly invisible, or one-dimensional in not only popular narratives, but also in the predominant narratives of black women in post-World War II America. Two, it will require greater excavation of the lives and struggles of low-income black women themselves, and a willingness to witness how life on the margins of the margins in the past has had relative, rel, rel, relevatory power and has programmatic and activist implications for us today. It will require the conscious examination of and a forthright and vociferous confrontation with the politics surrounding the research and production of scholarly projects that tend to either more highly value or position 
the albeit still necessary recuperative black liberation projects and stories of certain types of black women, while displacing, disciplining, marginalizing, ignoring, or casting out the stories of other types of black women whose lives, experiences, positions in society may make us uncomfortable and more, and uh, actually, dare I say, more potentially expose or indict the uninterrogated governing mentalities shaping the historical projects in which we are or seemingly are not concerned about or engaged in. How do the lives, then, the last question, how do the lives and experiences of these historical subjects help us to think about social justice and the history and the contemporary politics differently. Thank you. <laughs>